Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Angry Houses with the Mighty Jingles. <laughs> what are you smoking, old man? Well, Jeremy Clarkson once referred to tanks as big angry houses. And uh, I kind of liked it, <laughs> so I thought I'd use it today. Anyway, in our first clip, I am very happy to present Oop Go To Guy here in the ELC Even 90. However, this battle, here on the Normandy D-Day map, was mostly fairly unremarkable. Except for one moment, which left me scratching my head in bewilderment at how anybody could be as oblivious as, well, what you're about to see. As I said, this particular clip isn't really so much about your go-to guy here as it is about one of the other players on the enemy team. As we can see here, Go-to guy doesn't exactly cover himself in glory right at the start of the match when he gets hit by the CS-52 after misdriving straight into a windmill and messing up his escape, losing practically a third of his entire health in the opening minutes of the match. That's unfortunate, it was avoidable, but it's not really important. What's important is what happens when Go-to guy makes it into the enemy cap circle relatively early on in this match, and finds himself face to face with an enemy Scorpion G Tier 8 Premium Tank Destroyer. Now I'm not suggesting that what you're going to see is in any way because the Scorpion G is a Premium Tank Destroyer, can be bought by any Muppet who's never even played the game before, and literally be the first vehicle that they play. As I'm sure we're all too painfully aware, the length of time that you've been playing World of Tanks has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on how much you've learned and how well you play. I'm sure we've all seen people with less than 400 battles played pulling off amazing displays of skill, and utter potatoes with 14,000 battles played in the E100 who still can't manage to drag their win rate above 35%. Oh, but Jingles, win rate doesn't know. You're wrong. After a sufficiently large sample size of battles played, win rate is the only statistic that shows how good or bad a player you are. Although if it makes you feel any better, by all means, continue to delude yourself otherwise. Meanwhile, Oop Go To Guy has decided that he's going to be a bit cheeky. He's approaching the enemy cap circle. Probably has zero expectations of actually being able to win by capping at this early stage of the battle, but hey, you never know your luck. It's got to be worth a try. At the very least, it's going to draw enemy forces away from the front line. There's only one piece of cover in this cap circle that could conceivably hide anything, and that is of course exactly where he is. And what we're about to see happen, I think, can probably best be summed up by quoting one of my favourite Monty Python sketches. This is Mr Nesbit of Harlow, Newtown. Mr Nesbit, would you stand up, please? Mr Nesbit has learned the value of not being seen. However, he has chosen a very obvious piece of cover. In fact, he has chosen the only piece of cover. But apparently it is not quite obvious enough for the driver of the Scorpion G over there, who is completely mystified as to why he cannot see anything in the cap circle. And it's only when the Conway turns up and threatens to proximity detect him that Oop Go To Guy realises that the game is up and gets the hell out of dodge completely, totally and utterly scot-free while claiming a kill despite the presence of two enemy tank destroyers within a hundred metres of his position. I think we can safely conclude that Oop Go To Guy has mastered the art of not being seen. Moving on swiftly to today's main event. This is Monkey 25 or Monkai 20, whatever. Monkey. Monkey! I can't help but find it more than a little ironic that Monkey here, and while he never claims to be a good player, he's going to have a very good game here, is in Circonflex's clan in World of Tanks, and yet, as you can tell by the camo pattern on his M6 Heavy, he's in Des Games' as team. <laughs> so, <laughs> Zircon, I think you might want to have a word here. There's a traitor in your ranks. Now, I must stress that Monkey here is not a great player. He never claims to be, and no doubt he's going to be doing things 
that are going to have the seasoned world of tanks veterans rolling their eyes in despair. But he's not a great player. He's an average Joe. He's not a rainbow farting super unicorn. And he's justifiably proud of the match that he's about to play. Even if he is sitting stationary sideways on in the middle of open ground waiting to get shot at. Something that you're going to see him do on more than one occasion. Nevertheless, he's very proud of this result and with good reason and he wanted to share it. So just shut up and watch him play. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he is of course helped by the fact that he's top tier in the M6 Heavy, which isn't a great tank, but I do think it's very underrated nonetheless. The armour is alright, it's not fantastic, it's very boxy, you do have to angle it to get any kind of advantage out of it, but it does have a very very punchy 90mm gun, which you don't have to unlock in order to get to the T29. More on that in a moment though, as he pumps a shot into the KV-2 over there. Now you know the KV-2's looking this way. And it's not that he doesn't know about side scraping and angling his armour, he just doesn't always feel that it's necessary to do it. It's not going to help him against the KV-2 because high explosive doesn't really care if you're angled. But it's nice to see him at least making the effort. And, uh, yeah, like I said, okay, his driver's been knocked out. But he didn't take a huge amount of damage there. It looked like he was attempting to immobilise the KV-2 by firing into the inside of the tracks. And that was good to see, because rather than going for the easy kill on the KV-1, he made sure he took out the far more dangerous KV-2 instead. Of course, he now also has the opportunity of finishing off the KV-1, who for some reason seems quite surprised at the fact that there's a loaded 90mm gun waiting for him to do exactly what he just did. Monkey is now in a fairly strong position. He's managed to get around behind the OI, who unfortunately was waiting for him to do exactly what the KV-1 just did. And yes, I know, coming out sideways on like this is just begging to get penetrated by the 85mm gun of the T-34-85, but, well, he ended up getting the kill, and the OI... I'm not entirely sure what the OI is doing. I don't think the OI really knows what he's doing either. I mean, he's not in a great spot. But he continues giving flat armour for Monkey to shoot at. I suppose it's possible that the OI realises he's doomed and he's just determined to add another kill to his total before his inevitable demise. And there are a pair of low health tanks in front of him that he could be killing but he spends so long trying to find a weak spot to shoot at that he ends up, well, not killing either of them. Another T-3485 pops up unexpectedly and manages to get a sneaky hit in, reducing Monkey's health to perilously low levels, but Monkey is able to get yet another kill, bringing his total to five, one more, for a top gun. The WZ-131G fake tank that was lurking around this location has also been taken out by somebody, so this end of the map should now theoretically be largely clear of enemy opposition. Meanwhile, regarding the 90mm gun on the M6 and why you should take it, even though it isn't required to unlock the T29, first, you should take it because it's a great gun and it will make playing the M6 very enjoyable. More importantly, you should take it because if you don't, you'll be playing the T29, a tier 7 heavy, with a 76mm gun, and that experience will make you hate life and everything that it stands for. Okay, this flank wasn't quite as empty as we may have led ourselves to believe. There is a VK 3001P out there, and he was able to get one hit in before Monkey was able to get into cover behind this rock. It looks like the VK, however, is only using the 75mm gun, judging by the damage that he did. Notice that it's here, now that he only has 65 health left, that Monkey finally starts becoming very, very cautious about getting shot at again. Fortunately, the cavalry has arrived. Even more fortunately, the VK, who was backing up into cover, decided actually, no, I'm going to advance further out into the open where I can be immobilised, sideways on in front of three enemy heavies and shot at over and over, and then just as he's about to make it back into cover, he does it again. <laughs> but wait, what's this? Enemy M4 improved. Luckily for Monkey, managing to miss with every shot that he's firing. A monkey, it has to be said, is not making it hard for the M4 to kill him, but then the M4, faced with a target that he absolutely definitely can kill with one shot, decides instead to go for a target that he can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
And there's Monkey's seventh kill. One more for a Randy Walters, but there's only one enemy vehicle left. Fortunately, he gets spotted right at the last second. And there it is, the Radley Walters medal for Monkey in the M6 Heavy. Not a particularly well-played battle, but Monkey never claimed he was a super unicum. But it is absolutely his first Radley Walters medal ever in World of Tanks, and something that regardless of how he got there, you have to admit, he can be justifiably proud of. Monkey, well done. Not a flawless performance, and if you can master that, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to get equally impressive results in the future, just with far less metaphorical eye-rolling in the comments sections of any YouTube videos. Everyone else, I hope you enjoyed all, or at the very least some of today's video, and as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.